Just say uh, next slide and anytime you want me to click. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Okay, so welcome to Sugar and Salt Part Two, using nonfiction techniques for writing fiction. You all know me now. My name is Monica Jamka. Um, to start things off, I wanted to share with you this extraordinary sculpture that is entirely made out of sugar by this artist, Kara E. Walker, who's pictured in front of it. It's a sphinx. Um, and the title is fantastic. I love when people really put a lot of creative effort into their titles as well. One of the things that bothers me the most is when there's something called untitled. I understand a lot of reasoning behind it, but still, I love it when someone has a really great title. So I'd like to read that title for you here. This sculpture is called at the behest of creative time, Kara E. Walker has confected a subtlety or the marvelous sugar baby, an homage to the unpaid and overworked artisans who have refined our sweet tastes from the cane fields to the kitchens of the new world on the occasion of the demolition of the Domino sugar refining plant. So that is that sculpture. You can learn more about it. There's a great article about it called the Sugar Sphinx um, in uh, the New Yorker. If you Google it, I'm sure you'd find it. All right, next slide, please. So we're looking at some key ingredients for nonfiction. These four elements really stand out for nonfiction. You've got research, element of discovery, form, and something that portrays some kind of personal or intimate information. It's a, it's a different experience of the content than you would otherwise get from fiction because it is real. So there is this level of authenticity there that, um, that immediately makes the work closer to, to whoever is writing it. So we'll begin with research. Next slide, please. We've all heard this quote, I'm sure, real life is stranger than fiction. And really it's true. Uh, we can see uh, just you know many examples from the last year that we've had. <laughs> COVID has certainly challenged many of our uh, realities. And so there's, there's a lot of inspiration simply from the last year that we can pull from as far as real life being stranger than fiction. Um, how do we infuse extra information into our work since it is based on, on the truth? How do we add complexity and meaning into our fiction writing uh, using research, how might we make our characters, our dialogue, our plots, our conflicts, our themes, everything that we would incorporate into our writing, whether we're writing something short or much, much more, uh, you know, in a long form, how can we make it more unique and intriguing and complex and dynamic? Well, next slide, please. We can employ a lot of journalistic techniques. Um, I have an undergrad degree in journalism. And so in my creative nonfiction writing, I've often come back to my journalism uh, training to help infuse the kind of work that I do now in, in creative aspects. Um, and there's a lot to, to learn from journalism, even if you've never done any kind of journalism on your own or have no experience with journalism other than consuming it. Um, but you can always ask questions right we can interview people we can we can develop relationships with people and simply see where the material goes see how things grow organically we can follow leads always you can start with the people you know you can talk with friends and family the people you feel the most comfortable with ask people to connect you with others if they can give you some kind of in with somebody else um, if they're part of some kind of organization or a group or, you know, it, it, there's a snowball effect that can happen very quickly when you start to ask questions and you start to get your own personal contacts involved. And the reality is that a lot of people really do enjoy talking about themselves and answering questions about themselves. And so you can always start with something very simple, something basic. How are you? Tell me about your day. You know, how is your family? How, how has your week been? How are you experiencing pandemic life now? And it just can grow from there and turn into something that becomes a much more intimate conversation that, that provides particular information or details that you would have never expected that can turn into some kind of source of inspiration for your writing. If you're already writing something, you have a topic in mind, you can always say these magic words, I'm working on a piece. People tend to be intrigued by that and um, 
while some people shy away from, from being involved, especially if it's some kind of controversial topic, likely they might talk to you anyway if, if you um, promise that they will remain anonymous or um, simply want to get their opinion about a particular thing. We all like to express our opinions about anything. So it's, it's a matter of how you bring that conversation around, how you establish trust with people you speak with. And um, you can always let silence help you. It's natural for people to want to fill the space when there's silence, when there's no conversation, when there's a pause or a natural lull in, the, in whatever it is you might be talking about. And so try just perhaps letting that silence settle in and see what comes of it. Oftentimes people will offer up a little extra something. I think this is probably a technique that um, police officers and detectives use often um, because there's this natural tendency to want to fill that space. So try it out for yourself and see what comes of it. Um, there's a lot of other kind of immersion techniques that you might use from being inspired by journalism. Uh, you know, you can, you can, I remember actually there was a professor of mine, uh, a journalism professor who encouraged everyone to at least learn how to smoke, not to smoke, but to learn how to smoke because pre-COVID days, you know, it was very common that people would just kind of gather outside a workplace or wherever, and you're just kind of standing around smoking, there's not much happening, and it's a perfect environment to conjure up a little chat, gather some sort of little detail or information, or simply to just stand there and smoke or pretend to smoke while you eavesdrop a little bit and see what comes out of that. Especially if you're writing fiction, you can infuse your work with uh, eavesdropping by listening to other people having conversations. You can get inspired by the way that they use their tone, their language. You can notice how people use body language, gestures, all kinds of things like that. So all wonderful techniques to help bring your fiction to life and, uh, and, and maybe give you a new idea or a new direction where you might take your writing. Another great um, thing to keep in mind is to be prepared. If you are speaking with someone who is of a particular, has particular experience or has a particular role or whoever, whoever it is, it's always good to have some knowledge about this person ahead of time so that you can maybe ask a more pointed question or you can indicate that you have some understanding about this person's life or, or their experiences or their opinions already about something that may be controversial. And that can show to this person that you've taken the time and the care to understand them and that you are really interested in who they are. And, um, and that helps to establish that trust as well to get that conversation going and to potentially possibly move that conversation uh, into another direction where you get even more information. Um, you can certainly use technology. We have lots of great apps already built into our phones. Uh, you can try things like Google Voice or Otter or GarageBand even. A lot of content is free. And um, it's important to be aware uh, what kind of laws and regulations are wherever you are. Um, New York State, for example, as is New Mexico, we are one party consent state, which means that if you are recording somebody else, you don't have to tell them about it. Now, people can have lots of different feelings about that. There can be a breach of trust if you don't tell them that you're recording them. Uh, so you have to just, I think, maybe feel out the situation and, and see what might be best in that particular conversation with this particular person feel it out, use your best judgment, but know that at least legally you're covered um, in New Mexico or in New York, um, as my slide shows here, that, uh, that you know, this is a one party consent state. You can also shake up how you take photos. If you are used to taking photos in a particular way through your phone, or if you have a camera that you use, um, or you just haven't really ever thought much about taking photos or you're used to just taking photos in social environments, try something new. Walk around your neighborhood and just take photos of the street. 
take photos of the cars you see passing by, take photos of, of your house, um, of your backyard, and then look at those photos and see if there's anything that stands out to you that maybe you hadn't really noticed before. There are great podcasts also that you can listen to for techniques and ideas as far as using journalistic tendencies um, or, or strategies where you can really learn how to ask questions if you're not familiar with talking to people or you know you're not you don't have a lot of experience interviewing people you can learn from these great podcasts so here are a few someone knows something it's from uh, it's a canadian podcast it's a there's a journalist who just revives cold cases and he travels uh, and talks with people about very traumatic things that have happened, murders, uh, people gone missing, and the way that he's able to connect with people in a really genuinely um, caring, concerned way. I think it's extraordinary to see how people uh, do end up trusting him quite quickly and how they become um, involved with him and, and want to work with him and collaborate with him to help ultimately so solve some particular crime. How to Fail with Elizabeth Day is also a wonderful example of how uh, you, know, you can ask a lot of questions about potentially sensitive topics and turn it into a really positive, wonderful, encouraging experience um, and, and take away stigma or um, negative associations from, in this particular case, the topic of failure. So every guest who joins with Elizabeth Day talks about the specific ways that they have failed in their lives. I think it's a brilliant concept. Uh, a couple more podcasts, just quickly. Radio Lab, 99% Invisible. These are excellent podcasts, but there's so many out there. I encourage you to, to look into them if you haven't really listened to any. And just, you know, pull out whatever works for you. If you like the way that somebody in particular talks uh, to people or gathers information, try it out for yourself. Or if there's something that stands out to you that you find really irritating, you don't like the way a particular person approaches a subject or something like that, that's also a very uh, rich experience to learn from and, and you know that perhaps that's not something that you wanna try yourself. Practice, save often and back up your work. These are golden rules, always, always, whatever, however you talk to people, however you end up recording information, whether you're taking photographs, whether you're you know, using video, whatever, back up your work. You never know what's going to happen. Um, all right, next slide, please. So some additional ways that you can use a sort of journalistic approach to research, dig into libraries, of course. Libraries are rich with information. Archives, there's so much content online as well. Um, there's a lot of classified information that gets released every so often. So. Don't miss that. There's always very interesting stuff kind of buried in those files. Um, lots of great public domain sites too, just filled with information. Wikimedia Commons, Library of Congress, New York Public Library has an ever-growing digital collection and so much more. Talk to your local librarian always. We love the library, support the libraries as much as possible. Um, visit you know, historical societies and museums online. The silver lining of COVID is that actually now we have access to a lot more, I think, than we did previously because people have shifted online, made more available online, oftentimes for free or for some you know, minimal amount or for donation. Um, so let's support those uh, organizations and, and companies and businesses and, and museums and all of that uh, as much as we can. The Met also has a lot of inf uh, content online. So there's a lot that you can use from your computer without leaving your chair, you can just dive in and gather a lot of information that way. Um, you might also explore online sources like Google Maps, Zillow, Airbnb. These are all great sources to look into if you're writing, um, well, anything. You just need some inspiration about a setting, place in your story. You want to make a house really concrete in details. Well, maybe you've thought about it a little bit, but looking on Zillow, suddenly you'll really be able to pinpoint exactly what the color of the walls are in your character's house, where exactly this person lives, 
why it was important for these characters to be close to a park or to a, a, some sort of water source or something like that. So, you know, imagination is important, but there's so much available to you that you can just tap into right away and build from. So if you're feeling like uh, you need a little push, a little extra um, jumpstart to, to your creative process, those are all great sources to look to. Of course, you can go down a rabbit hole if you are familiar with Reddit or other you know, topic focused websites like that, where people share very specific interests. You can get into long conversations or you, know, you can read all of these uh, back and forth messages that people share with each other about particular um, uh, topics. And you, know, you can even use those messages on Reddit, for example, to, uh, to inspire the way that your character speaks or the kind of um, inflection or tone that, that this character uses or something like that. You can of course get lots of information and inspiration from social media sites. So if you're not familiar with Instagram or you spend most of your time on Twitter but you have no idea what TikTok is about, you know, just dive in, you know, spend maybe half an hour just sort of looking around, seeing what it's all about. And that can help to infuse some sort of personality or um, even appearance or, you know, real life behavior uh, can, can affect, you know, what you're writing. Um, maybe you're writing a first person narrative and you're kind of struggling with connecting actually with a character because this is just somebody who's very different from you. Well, you know, you can kind of infuse that character with somebody that you've found on a social media site who's very real um, and you can just build it out from there. And of course you can try retail sites too. While you're taking a break and you're shopping online, you might think, well, actually, what would my character wear if they were to shop on this website? Or I just don't know at all how I might actually even picture this person in my mind. I just have a general idea of who this person is. Well, you know, you can actually try to dress them and see what would fit their personality and just see where that takes you. All right, next slide, please. Other ways that you can help uh, guide yourself through research you know, crack open a textbook or, or a handbook of some kind or a catalog, anything that's outside of your usual reading and just work from whatever catches your eye. If there's just something that's so bizarre to you or so interesting or intricate that you're just completely not familiar with, maybe that's a place to, to start from. Challenge yourself with a 30 minute writing exercise and see where that takes you or how that might somehow infuse your work um, later. You can just, you know, Kind of hold on to it if, if inspiration doesn't strike right away. Um, good thing to know if you're not familiar with this already is that Amazon often provides you know some pages at least of a novel or whatever book uh, for free. So you can poke around and see if um, a manual on gardening or um, a guide to hummingbird feeders or something like that. You know, you can you can look on Amazon and see those preview pages and glean some information from from that free content uh, and see if that's useful to you. Travel catalogs also a great way to to find some inspiration. Guidebooks, um, excellent ways to talk about you know particular itineraries or destinations or to help provide your work infuse your work with with visuals for your reader. You don't really have to make up, you know, a, a vacation from scratch if your character is going to some place that really exists. Just go ahead and and use existing content to really bring that particular setting and the sensory experiences of that setting to life um, by by simply going to to content that already exists. You don't. You have, you know, it's not necessary for you to actually have ever traveled to Bora Bora. Now you have so much information online or through books or through other sources that you can create a very genuine experience um, without ever actually having gone there. I also encourage you to check out any sort of government run or university run websites, especially regarding outdoor spaces. Um, so Cornell Lab of Ornithology is an amazing resource online. 
lots of information there about birds, about history of ornithology, about migration patterns, about um, you can hear what all sorts of different birds sound like. Their library is incredible. Uh, national park websites also, just so much information there. So you can you know, travel to a place uh, through these particular sources and the reader will be able to travel with you uh, in a very authentic and real way based on all of this great information that's out there. Certainly you can be inspired by a documentary. There's so much content available, um, even just on YouTube that's free. And you can always look to very real news stories or you know, even you know true crime or anything like that for a particular narrative that you might launch from for your own story. So maybe you hear a story on the news that's just very strange or tragic or awful. No one says you can't take a part of that story and then build from there. All right, next slide, please. You can also find great anecdotal information or weird little you know, eccentric factoids from quirky sources. These are a few that I, <laughs> I love to look to every now and then if I need a little bit of, uh, of inspiration, a little jolt of energy in my writing. Rob Bresney, I'm, I'm not particularly into astrology, but Rob Bresney has these great um, horoscopes because there's always some little bit, some little fun factoid that's written into everything that he, he writes. So there, it's a great way actually to learn about some obscure painter or some random musician or some uh, strange, you know, phenomenon in nature or something like that. It's really, it's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun reading and you can just maybe pop that into whatever you're writing as a little extra quirk about a character or use that as a, as a sort of launching point for some other theme or um, aspects or whatever to your writing. Atlas Obscura, of course, has a lot of really great information about kind of uh, obscure, lesser known type phenomena around the world or, or wonderful places to travel to that are sort of off the beaten path or bizarre or interesting aspects of history. Um, Atlas Obscura is a great place to go to, to just have a little fun and see something new. Dark tourism also, there's a series on Netflix about dark tourism. This is a, a concept that people love to travel or at least before COVID, people really were excited about traveling to places that had some sort of dark or macabre connotation. So um, places where there was some sort of natural disaster or um, there's a forest, a supposedly haunted forest in Japan, I believe, that uh, where a lot of people have committed suicide. Dark places, dark tourism, it, it's a thing. People are really into it. You might kind of dip your toe in, into that world for a bit too, just to see what comes of it in your writing. Medical sites too, of course, you can infuse your characters with a variety of medical ailments and see how that affects their growth as a character or, or the narrative as a whole, um, what kind of conflict and tension and other difficulties can come about from that, um, simply from spending a little bit of time on a, on a medical website. And certainly you can look to pamphlets, business cards, menus, classified ads in local papers, both new and old, whether that's in print or or online, looking at archives, any sorts of other documentation for um, ideas and to, to help create your world, your characters in an even more authentic way. Uh, another idea is to look at a, a company's hierarchy or their about page to consider the professional lives of, of your characters and what their goals might be, what strengths and what weaknesses play into the job they have what would be next for them? You know, what, what would be a, a sort of entry level position in their field and what is it that they might be striving towards? All right, next slide, please. 
Visit new sites you've never been to before. You can always go to other countries too and check out expat resources that are in English. If you speak another language, even better, you can you know sort of expand your your um, content availability that way. But there's some form of English news or or some sort of um, newsletter or something like that in pretty much every country around the world. So if you're feeling particularly stuck with any kind of news sites, or you're just wanting to experience something different, get out of sort of the American viewpoint for a little while, just see what uh, the French Guiana has to say about something that's going on in the world right now, or see what American expats in Rwanda might be talking about right now. And then there are lots of free resources that are probably available to you that you may not even know about. So there are great phone apps that are free or that you know that you have to access but may already be on your phone. Um, iTunes U is one of those. There's another one um, that's called Great Courses that I discovered not long ago uh, on my TV. And there are some that you have to pay for, particularly under Great Courses, but a lot of stuff is free. Same thing with, there's a website called Coursera. You can actually get certifications or maybe even degrees actually in some, in some topics. Um, some things you again have to pay for, but a lot of stuff is, is available for free. So great way to really deep dive into a particular topic and, um, and see if that may help you with your writing. And certainly you can always be inspired by art. Donna Tartt's novel, The Goldfinch, is certainly an example of that. Uh, it takes place, a very pivotal part of the book in any case, takes place at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. There's also a great website called ekphrastic.net. There's the link there where uh, folks are encouraged to write some sort of flash piece about a particular work of art. So all fun ways to do deep dives and to see how real research, real nonfiction, real true content that exists out there in the world can infuse your own fiction writing. All right, next slide, please. So these two books I wanted to share with you, these are uh, both novels and um, Lincoln in the Bardo, it's the winner of the Man Booker Prize. It's been on lots of top lists. Um, this is a really interesting book because it takes the event, uh, the very real event of Lincoln's son, uh, Willie, who was 11 years old, who died. And it, it transforms this event into um, this story about Willie being stuck basically in, in kind of this purgatory, uh, which is called the Bardo, uh, which is, a, it comes from a, a Tibetan tradition, um, that, that term. And he, while he's in this purgatory-like place, Willie meets other ghosts um, and they interact and they seek penance and they commiserate and they, they have all of these great interactions. So that, this is an interesting uh, example of how you can take a very real event and, uh, and build this whole fictional world around it. The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society by Marianne Schaefer and Annie Barrows. This is a lovely book that also was turned into a lovely movie. It's an epistolary novel, which means that it's in the form of letters. Um, Marianne Schaefer, who's the primary author, she wanted to write a biography of Kathleen Scott, who's the wife of this English polar explorer. She traveled from the US to England and she was disappointed in the primary sources that she found. She just, they were kind of uh, decayed. There wasn't really that much information. And she was a little disenchanted by this direction that she thought she would be going into to write this book. Uh, so while she was traveling around in England, she decided to explore Guernsey, which is in the Channel Islands. And she, she got there and then she got stuck at the airport because of a, a really thick, dense fog that had rolled in. And so while she was at the airport, just waiting this fog out, she came across a lot of uh, books at the airport bookshop um, where she read about the island's occupation during World War II. And she became so inspired by what she read that she decided to completely shift direction with her writing. 
and write this novel based on these letters, these real letters that she discovered and this real information that she learned about, about these people during World War II and how they survived. Um, this book took her, so actually it took her 20 years before she actually started the novel. Um, she took a long time researching and uh, I'm sure real life just sort of got in the way often um, as it does for all of us. Her niece, uh, who is Annie Barrows, helped her finish it and it had been accepted by a publisher in 2006. It was actually published posthumously in 2008. And it's incredible too, because this was Mary Ann Schaefer's one and only novel. Um, and uh, like I said, the movie came out, uh, it was lovely. It uh, came out in 2018. So I think this is also a wonderful example of the importance of persevering and that we are never, it's never too late to, to go in a different direction with our writing. It's never too late to finish our book. Um, just keep working at it. All right, next slide, please. So allow yourself to go where the information takes you, but it's important to keep in mind that there is such a thing as too much research and beware of really going down that rabbit hole. Um, this is a link to a wonderful article by Nick Dybeck, how too much research can ruin your novel. He wrote about this experience. And uh, next slide, please. He wrote, it soon became clear that I could tackle a book a week for the rest of my life and still own enough untouched tomes on World War I to build my own mausoleum. There was something of an addict's logic to the process. Just one more book and I'll know enough. Just one more and this will be easy. After a year of working on the novel, I had to accept that I was doing something wrong. So remember that while research is very helpful, very useful, important, um, great, fun, exciting, all these different things, there is such a thing as too much of it. And if it's keeping you from actually writing, then maybe you need to take a step back from research and decide that enough is enough and you can go forth with, with what you already have. This is also a great quote from the French composer Debussy who wrote, uh, he was complaining about the other musicians uh, of his time and he, uh, and specifically about their compositions, he wrote, they smell of the lamp, not of the sun. So don't let your research stifle your creativity and your productivity and don't, don't let it smell too much of the lamp and not of the sun. Okay, next slide, please. So we are at our first writing prompt. So for this writing prompt, we are again gonna take 10 minutes and I'd like you to grab something around you, whatever it might be, some kind of receipt or a piece of mail, or maybe you've got something written on your mug, whatever it is, take a phrase or a sentence that stands out to you and write it into a brief fictional scene involving those exact words in quotation marks. And I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself and we will come back at just three o'clock.
Okay. I hope that was a fun exercise for everybody. Anyone want to share? Sure, I'll be glad to share. Martin, sure, yeah, thank you. I smelled fire as soon as I pulled up my driveway. A jolt of fear instantly. I ran inside and sniffed, but the smell was diminished. I checked upstairs, same result. Maybe the fire wasn't in the house, a brush fire somewhere maybe. I looked around, no smoke, but something was going on in the shed behind the house, flashes of light in the window. I ran to the shed and saw a gray box on the wall with a red label that said, main service disconnect located under cover. I lifted the cover and flipped the switch. The flashes of light stopped instantly. I grabbed the fire extinguisher from the house, ran back to the shed to put the fire out, but um, found that a space heater had melted and arced um, and the fire had gone out by itself already, unfortunately. And um, that's the actual label <laughs> that I saw. <thought. laughs> <Yes. laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's great. Great action, lots of motion and activity happening in that little piece. Thank you so much for sharing it. Anyone else? I'll go. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Lauren? Yes. Okay. It has one more, it has more than one message, she said in her thick accent, but I didn't know what the first message was. It didn't help that I didn't speak the language or speak or read the language. I wanted to ask, ask her for a translation, but I could see her leaning toward the door and a literal translation would not give me any sense of any idiom that may be the clue to the message number two. She handed it back to me as another customer was announced by the bell on the back of the door. The box had called to me grabbing my attention away from the usual tourist tchotchkes, painted bowls, cut paper, oh, uh, um, paper cutouts of roosters and flowers. Maybe it was its uniqueness and mystery, but it was also, it also felt a little dark. That's as far as I got. That's interesting. Where do you think you might take that? <laughs> um, not sure. Um, I, the first line was the quote, I was out of a book of tarot cards, but um, I wasn't sure where it was gonna go, but my grandmother is Polish. Hmm. And so the painted bowls and the cut paper flowers. Um, so I wanted to go somewhere with that. Cool. That's great. Thank you very much for sharing that. Thanks. Anybody else? No? All right. Any questions at this point? All right, we shall continue on then. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. We are now going to look at the element of discovery. So nonfiction has some kind of takeaway. There's always some sort of gem buried in, in all the other stuff. So for your fiction piece, what is the takeaway? You can always use the act of research in of itself as a device to actually carry you through that narrative. The reader can come along with you for, for the ride of, of this discovery, right? They can sort of be sitting next to you as you uncover whatever it is that's happening. Um, journalists often use, or, or you know, creative nonfiction writers often use this kind of strategy, but you can certainly use that strategy for fiction too, whether you're writing a short story or something longer, turn it into a novel. Um, 
it can be something that you know you you could consider sort of in real time it all unfolds organically or there might be a lot of skipping around you could play with time with jumping around you can incorporate foreshadowing and reflection throughout the work um, and and uh, be as creative as you want to since it is fiction there's a lot more freedom there than there would be in nonfiction. Um, I do want to just point out that there's a tendency sometimes I mean as writers we all approach our writing very specifically from our perspective um, we write for ourselves primarily but it is important at some point to consider your reader. So this question, what's the takeaway? You know, if, you, if you're writing, we talked a lot about this last weekend where, you know, if you're writing nonfiction, if you're writing something like a memoir, you might be uncovering a lot of information about yourself. If you are, if you're writing fiction, you still, I think, have to think about this question of what's the takeaway? What's in it for the reader? Why should the reader pay attention to this particular work. Um, I think it takes away from the romance a little bit from writing because we like to believe that writing can just be useful just in of itself and certainly can be for us. But as, from the reader's perspective, we wanna make sure that, that there is something worthwhile in it for them. And that as we might with cooking, we are providing something with some sort of nurturing aspect or soothing or nourishing element to our work that they can take away from it. Um, and I think perhaps it could be the sort of lack of romance when you're thinking about what, what the reader can take away from your work. It could just potentially be a cost to creating art in this medium. It's just something to think about. Um, all right, next slide, please. I'd like to share this excerpt from H is for Hawk by Helen MacDonald. She returns to her passion here for, in this book, this is a memoir, um, for her, her passion for falconry, for hawking. Uh, and she, it was something that she got into at a much earlier age, much younger age, but uh, kind of lost track with it, just sort of, what, for whatever reason, it didn't really stick as a passion and a hobby as she got older. And then her father passed away and she returned to this, to this hobby and it sort of renewed her sense of herself, um, taught her different things about life and helped her with, with grief. And it's a beautiful book for many, many reasons, but an excellent example to, to turn to for a lot of different elements of craft. So this is a nonfiction book, um, but there are certainly a lot of strategies that we can use from, from Helen MacDonald's way of writing with fiction. So I'm just gonna go ahead and, and read this quickly here. It was 8.30 exactly. I was looking down at a little sprig of Mahonia growing out of the turf, its oxblood leaves like buffed pigskin. I glanced up and then I saw my goshawks. There they were, a pair soaring above the canopy in the rapidly warming air. There was a flat, hot hand of sun on the back of my neck, but I smelt ice in my nose, seeing those goshawks soaring. I smelt ice and bracken stems and pine resin, goshawk cocktail. They were on the soar. Goshawks in the air are a complicated gray color, not slate gray, nor pigeon gray, but a kind of rain cloud gray. And despite their distance, I could see the big powder puff of white undertail feathers fanned out with a thick blunt tail behind it, and that superb bend and curve of the secondaries of a soaring goshawk that makes them utterly unlike sparrowhawks. And they were being mobbed by crows and they just didn't care, like whatever. A crow barreled down on the male and he sort of raised one wing to let the crow pass. Crow was not stupid and didn't dip below the hawk for long. These goshawks weren't fully displaying. There was none of the skydiving I'd read about in books but they were loving the space between each other and carving it into all sorts of beautiful concentric cords and distances. A couple of flaps and the male, the tersel, would be above the female and then he'd drift north of her and then slip down fast like a knife cut, a smooth calligraphic scrawl underneath her. And she'd dip a wing and then they'd soar up again. They were above a stand of pines right there and then they were gone. One minute, my pair of goshawks was describing lines from physics textbooks in the sky. 
and then nothing at all. I don't remember looking down or away. Perhaps I blinked. Perhaps it was as simple as that. And in that tiny black gap, which the brain disguises, they dived into the wood. You learn. Today, I thought, not nine years old and not bored, I was patient and the hawks came. I got up slowly, legs a little numb from so long motionless, and found I was holding a small clump of reindeer moss in one hand, a little piece of that branching, pale green-gray lichen that can survive just about anything the world throws at it. It is patience made manifest. Keep reindeer moss in the dark, freeze it, dry it to a crisp, it won't die. It goes dormant and waits for things to improve. Impressive stuff. I weighed the little twiggy sphere in my hand, hardly there at all. And on a sudden impulse, I stowed this little stolen memento of the time I saw the hawks in my inside jacket pocket and went home. I put it on a shelf near the phone. Three weeks later, it was the reindeer moss I was looking at when my mother called and told me my father was dead. So we have this sense as the reader that we're sitting next to Helen as she's watching these goshawks soar. We have this wonderful sensory information, not just visual, but also fragrance, texture, temperature. And we start to see that there are themes happening here with these goshawks, with this reindeer moss about it being, you know, able to survive anything as it relates to death and specifically the grief that she feels for her father passing away and all of these other things. So an excellent book to turn to um, for nonfiction to see how perhaps some of these strategies um, you might employ for your fiction writing. Okay, next slide, please. This is an excerpt from the book, Among the Living and the Dead, A Tale of Exile and Homecoming on the War Roads of Europe by Inara Verzemniecks. She establishes early on in her book what exactly the purpose of this book is, what exactly the reader will take away if they agree sort of to go along in this journey. In other words, if they go ahead and purchase the book and, and read through it. And she's just very direct with her language, but also is very romantic and lyric and, and poetic. And there's a lot of imagery that happens here. And oftentimes, um, it's easy to forget actually that this is a nonfiction. And that's, I think, a very powerful testament to her skill as a writer that she's able to create these worlds and this experience. Uh, and certainly you have the sense also that you're sort of moving along with her in the story, even though she jumps from time to time and she incorporates some kind of, you know, imaginative aspects to it, uh, things that couldn't specifically be described as nonfiction. Um, that are, it's almost as if, uh, you know, you might be sort of a, being guided by a ghost from the Christmas Carol or something like that, where you're sort of spanning time and place. So I'll go ahead and read this excerpt here too. This is where I come from, from this place of flight, daughter, granddaughter, and great-granddaughter to those who once lived at the edge of the war roads and who came to feel the roads terrible pull. What happened to my family here happened long before I was born. But I know now that my life started the instant the road claimed them, that when it led them away from the land all those years ago and scattered them, some to the west, to be dropped at the edge of the ocean they called silent in their old language, and others to the east to disappear into the territories of the banished, it made their exile mine as much a part of me as any characteristic governed by heredity. Like the nearsightedness that by the time I was seven would reduce my view of the world to what fell within an arm's length in front of me. Whatever lay in the distance, no matter how hard I tried to make out its contours, was always lost to me. It helped that I was raised to believe in the existence of what I could not see. The language and stories of my childhood were always referencing hidden places, and one of those places waited on the other side of death. That's what the old homesick Latvians would say that when we die, we go to live in a land that's beyond, that's found beyond the sun. They said this not as superstition or myth, but as habit, the reflexive tick of centuries of belief now preserved in figures of speech that tended to emerge late at night after the drinks had left everyone tremulous and heavy lidded, such as one day we will meet in a place that exists beyond the sun. Beyond the sun, life is said to be not too dissimilar from this one. In fact, it's said that there, 
We do the same things we've always done, except we are no longer alive. Dead farmers look after dead cows that are herded by dead dogs. Dead children presumably go to schools where they are taught by dead teachers who take their grading home at night to apartment buildings full of dead neighbors. Dead cats leave dead moles on the doorsteps of the dead. There are moments when this strikes me as one of the most strange and beautiful ideas I have ever heard. And then there are moments when it makes me terribly sad imagining a world unfolding parallel to this one where everyone is going through the motions of home, trying to hold on to its shape and memories, but it isn't home. And now from within this sadness, a realization, I'm not describing the dead anymore. I'm describing us and our life in the little bowed house that we shared, my grandmother, Livia, my grandfather, Emils, and me. So certainly with fiction writing, you have even more area to expand into something imaginative, um, but, uh, but Inara Vergemnix does this beautiful idea. Where last week we talked about how, you know, if you, if you sort of put qualifiers on your language, you can say, well, you know, I imagine it to be this way, or you bring in some element of the supernatural or something that is not necessarily nonfiction um, into your work uh, because of the way that you just, you talk about it. So something to, uh, to look to also. And, and again, this book is, is just a tremendous uh, example of all sorts of techniques that you might try for yourself. Okay, and then one more um, excerpt here. This is from uh, Out in the Great Alone. This is actually a selection from the prologue by Brian Phillips. He wrote this incredible long form journalism piece for ESPN. And it, it was so long actually that he organized it into chapters and, and this prologue. So I wanna share this with you as a, a way of um, in, incorporating a lot of different strategies, but, uh, but this kind of element of discovery, taking the reader along for the ride um, and, and sort of presenting this adventure that lies ahead. In late February, I flew to Alaska with the intention of following the 2013 Iditarod all the way from Anchorage to Nome. This was a plan of, I think I might be quoting my editors on this, questionable sanity, even before you consider the logistical complexity of chasing several dozen sled dog teams across a subarctic wilderness the size of Eastern seaboard. That's not an exaggeration, by the way. There's a disagreement over how long the Iditarod Trail really is, but the best estimate estimates peg it at right around the distance from Carnegie Hall to Epcot. The fastest mushers take around nine days to reach the finish line, and that's assuming ideal conditions, say 15 below, with blue skies and hard packed ice slick snow. I was staring at a weekend and a half of bone deep cold, probable verging on inevitable blizzards, baneful travel conditions, and total isolation from the civilized Reed broadband having world. I hate snow, do not play winter sports, keep the thermostat at 65 on a good day, and haven't logged out of Spotify since 2011. I'm not even a dog person. I called the pilot. Do you have experience in winter survival type situations? He asked. Sure, I said, I survived them by staying indoors. It's a technique that's worked well for me so far. Have you spent any time in small aircraft? I've, uh, well, I've watched movies where people spent time in small aircraft. How about winter camping, backpacking, anything along those lines? Day hikes, I said miserably. There was a pause on the other end of the line. Well, he said, I'll be straight with you. There are a lot of ways to die in Alaska. That was in September. Over the next four months, the phrase, please don't die, started cropping up with maybe slightly more frequency than you'd like to see in your work emails. Why was I so keen to do this? To make this trip for which I was patently unprepared? It had something to do with Alaska itself, its sheer hugeness and emptiness, 731,449 people spread out over 570,640 square miles, a territory larger than Spain, France, and Germany combined, holding slightly fewer people than the metro area of Dayton, Ohio. I mean, the density stats are a joke. The US average is 87.4 inhabitants per square mile. The 45th most dense state, New Mexico, thins that down to 17. Alaska has 1.28, and more than 40% of Alaskans live in one city. 
Factor out metropolitan anchorage and you're looking at about three quarters of one person per square mile in a land area 10 times the size of Wisconsin. I don't know how you roll emotionally with respect to population density tables. Personally, I find this haunting. That high white vanishing fog, doesn't it call to you too? No one's sure what the word Iditarod means. The best guess is that it comes from the Ingalic and Holikachuk word um, Hidahad, meaning faraway place. It's the name of a river. In 1908, a couple of prospectors found gold on one of the tributaries, Otter Creek. A boom town named for the river sprang up. Now it's a ghost city, an empty bank vault and an abandoned brothel. This year's race going right through it. People who'd been there told me about camping out under the Northern Lights, watching the dog's green eyes come gliding out of the dark. At some point during all this, I copied down a line from Melville. He's talking about being lost at sea here. It's the same thing. The intense concentration of self in the middle of such a heartless immensity. Come a week early, my pilot said, so you can learn how to fly the airplane. So here we have an absolute sense of uh, the purpose of this author's work. Uh, we are about to experience this journey, this experience, this um, adventure with him. We understand that there will be some difficulties, so there's some fun foreshadowing here. And I think the tone of this author works really well too because he's, he's a little bit more playful with his language. This dialogue that he's got between himself and, his, and the pilot <laughs> really underscores the potential complications and the danger that he's facing. And we also get the sense that he's really going into this topic without having a lot of experience beforehand, which is something that we can all relate to. Um, we're not experts in every field, of course. And so the fact that we might not be experts and that we are diving into something that's new to us is compelling in of itself. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and now lastly, we're going to look at creative nonfiction forms. So you can really find a lot of great examples in each of these, but just to go over them quickly, nonfiction often uh, appears in these sort of four big categories. You have something that's investigative or journalistic in nature. So, Subcategories in this one include something like an interview. We have um, Svetlana Alexievich's excellent book, The Unwomanly Face of War, where she interviews many, many women. And really that's, that's what makes her book just snippet after snippet after snippet of interviews with different women and all of their experiences of war um, in Russia, Ukraine. And it, it, it's powerful because it she almost just allows their voices to carry the story, to, 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 to impact the reader all on their own. There's not much else that she has to add to the book. So with fiction, we can come up with all of these quotes. We could pretend that we've gone through all of these different interviews. It's entirely made up, but why not? That could be a particular strategy, or maybe it's just a, something that we incorporate you know, for, for a few pages within a novel, or maybe one entire chapter is made up of an interview or something like that. Then you've got something that's in depth, uh, something like uh, I'll Be Gone in the Dark by Michelle McNamara. She was obsessed with the Golden State Killer. She was a big fan of true crime and she was unhappy with the progress on the case. And she felt like she could apply her own obsession and her own journalistic techniques um, and experience to trying to maybe help somehow. And her book actually helped solve this case. So if you're unfamiliar with the Golden State Killer, with the arrest that happened a couple of years ago, um, please do look into it. There's also an excellent documentary about this book and about Michelle McNamara's process in writing it called I'll Be Gone in the Dark on HBO. Very interesting, really worthwhile to check out. We've got immersive pieces, um, immersive books, something like Nickel and Dimed by Barbara Ehrenreich, where she leaves behind her life, her job, everything that she knows, 
and she allows herself the experience of fully getting into a particular lifestyle or, or role or whatever to have the most authentic experience and then write about that experience. And then there are of course, lots and lots of examples of books that are specific to whatever time we are in at the moment, things that are political in nature, things that tackle various current social issues. So all excellent ways to dive into a particular topic, see how that author did the research, presents the information and gather inspiration to use in your own writing. Another big category of creative nonfiction forms um, is the travel uh, category, something that's adventurous in nature. So here we have authors like Bill Bryson who write more along sort of social cultural commentary um, and then you've got someone like Rick Steves who really excels at writing very specific, concentrated, very useful travel guides. So why not read a travel guide, especially about a country you've never been to or even about America or about a state that you think about New Mexico. You think you know everything about New Mexico. You think you're familiar with, with uh, everything that goes on here or even a, a, a guide about Santa Fe specifically see what new information comes up and uh, whether you can incorporate that somehow into your own writing or that it perhaps inspires you in some other way. The category of nature or outdoor writing, uh, authors like Mary Oliver or John McPhee stand out here. Um, food too is a really big nonfiction form. Uh, there's so much happening with food writing. It's really come a long way in the last several years. There's a great roundup of excellent food writing found here on this link, uh, food52.com. Um, the staff picked out some of their best or some of their favorite food writing found online. So go ahead and research that too, to find some, some fun pieces and see how Food writing might be a way that you explore your own fiction. And then the category of reviews, whether that has to do with music or film or books or anything, really. You might incorporate a review in your novel. Maybe that is a chapter or maybe the entire book is written in that way. All right, next slide, please. And then we have the category of flash work too. This is also a growing category of work, typically 250 to 700 words. There are a lot of really excellent websites, um, literary journals online that publish flash work that seek it out. So if you wanna challenge yourself to writing something brief, uh, both in fiction and nonfiction, um, try it out, see what happens and then submit, see if, See if you get published that way. Brevitymagazine.com, brevitymag.com is an excellent source to find flash work. And there's, uh, there's a lot of other great um, literary journals online like River Teeth too, um, some other ones. Some, it, it depends on, on the words, but typically it's 250 to 700 words is what you can count on for flash work. Okay, and then experimental kind of forms. Here is one by Sarah Ryan called The Body Puzzle. As you can see, it's all written entirely as a crossword puzzle. So sort of a combination of flash pieces, each, each little number there, number one, the color I dye my hair, number three, the outline of an area or figure, and so on. It's a really interesting piece to look to and, um, see if you can fit fiction work into it. All right, next slide, please. Memoir is also a huge category of nonfiction, creative nonfiction, something also I think has been really developed in the last decade or so. Uh, we may even perhaps be in a golden age of memoirs. We're expanding what it means to, um, what a memoir means and how exactly it's, it's written. So it can be one cohesive book length work. This is a, a link here on lithub.com, 10 best memoirs of the decade. 
Um, I encourage you to, to check that out. Um, it can be a collection of essays. For example, Mine by Sarah Vereen was published by University of New Mexico Press a couple years ago. Um, or it could be a collage. So a mixture of poetry and images and photos and essays, all flash work, all kinds of different stuff, just sort of hodgepodge together to create whatever it is you want to represent, you know, for yourself. So there, there's no one specific way to create a memoir anymore. An example of a collage type of memoir would be uh, Jay-Z's Decoded, where he has a lot of images, a lot of graphics, a lot of color, song lyrics, um, images of uh, things that he's, you know, written on pieces of paper that then turned into songs or something like Sweet Venetienne by Sophie Kahl, where she essentially is a stalker. She, she goes to Venice and she notices a person who's very interesting to her and she just follows this person and takes photos along the way. And you see these photos in this book. So it's an interesting approach. <laughs> Again, you might wanna think about the legality of it, but if you're writing fiction, why not put yourself in the perspective of a stalker for a little while at least? Uh, down here below on the slide, I just wanted to point out also the book, My Autobiography of Carson McCullers by Jen Chaplin. This is a fun book too, from a craft perspective, because as you can see from the title, she's she is really writing about herself, but she sought to write a, a biography about Carson McCullers. That was sort of her initiation into writing this book. And as she began to do more research about Carson McCullers, she realized that there were a lot of things that I that she identified with that really resonated with her about Carson McCullers' life. And so it really ended up being a discovery of who she is. So that's an interesting way that you might shape something too. And here's the table of contents from Sarah Vereen's collection of essays, mine. As you can see, every single essay starts off with my. So there's a very conscientious approach to how she has structured and organized her content. All right, next chapter, uh, next slide, please. These are uh, slide shot, slides uh, or screenshots, excuse me, of, um, of Jay-Z's Decoded. So as you can see, there's just a really fun mixture and it makes the book very dynamic and engaging and visually very interesting too. All right, next slide. So a big element to um, nonfiction is the essay as well. Uh, and here within the category of essay, we have these four common subcategories. This, the, the way that essays are, I should say the subcategories are growing all the time. There are lots of different ways, just as there are lots of different ways to write memoirs. There are lots of different ways to write essays as well. And things are becoming even more experimental and interesting. So these are just sort of four broad subcategories, personal, lyric, braided, and experimental. Experimental is a sort of catch-all for everything else. But again, this is expanding and I really encourage everyone, if you're not reading a lot of contemporary essays, to look into it and see all the cool stuff that's out there. All right, next slide. This is an example from Time and Distance. Ex excuse me, yeah. before you go on, what does braided mean? So braided, for example, you um, we'll take a look here at, a, at an example, but braided, essentially you've got maybe, it's like two or three little mini essays all coming together. We'll take a look here in just a second. So Time and Distance Overcome, this, this could be an example of a braided essay. Um, I'll go ahead and read this part. Of what use is such an invention? The New York world asked shortly after Alexander Graham uh, Bell first demonstrated his telephone in 1876. The world was not waiting for the telephone. Bell's financial backers asked him not to work on this new invention because it seemed too dubious an investment. The ideas on which the telephone depended, the idea that every home in the country could be connected by a vast network of wires suspended from poles set an average of 100 feet apart, seemed far more unlikely than the idea that the human voice could be transmitted through a wire. 
Even now, it is an impossible idea that we are all connected, all of us. At the present time, we have a perfect network of gas pipes and water pipes throughout our large cities, Bell wrote to his business partners in defense of his idea. We have main pipes laid under the streets communicating by side pipes with the various dwellings. In a similar manner, it is conceivable that cables of telephone wires could be laid underground or suspended overhead, communicating by branch wires with private dwellings, counting houses, shops, manufac uh, manufactories, etc., uniting them through this main cable. Imagine the mind that could imagine this, that could see us joined by one branching cable. This was the mind of a man who wanted to invent more than the telephone, a machine that would allow the deaf to hear. For a short time, the telephone was little more than novelty. For 25 cents, you could see it demonstrated by Bell himself in a church, along with singing and recitations by local talent. From some distance away, Bell would receive a call from the invisible Mr. Watson. Then the telephone became a plaything of the rich. A Boston banker paid for a private line between his office and his home so that he could let his family know exactly when he would be home for dinner. Mark Twain was among the first Americans to own a telephone, but he wasn't completely taken with the device. The human voice carries entirely too far as it is, he remarked. By 1889, the New York Times was reporting a war on telephone poles. Whenever telephone companies were erecting poles, homeowners and business owners were saving them, uh, I'm sorry, were sawing them down or defending their sidewalks with rifles. Um, just for the sake of time, I won't go through all of it, but essentially you have this line, this thread through this essay of a very historic approach with uh, telephone poles and sort of the, the rise of the telephone in America. And then all of a sudden, Eula Biss switches, <coughs> excuse me, to how um, Black Americans were hung from telephone poles and how all of a sudden it took on a completely new idea and connotation. <clears throat> excuse me. So there's a very real shift in her writing and the way that she threads these two things together is quite compelling. So if you're not familiar with this essay, please do check it out. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, for the sake of time also, I won't get into this one in too much detail, but this is a, an essay called A Supposedly Fun Thing I'll Never Do Again by David Foster Wallace. <clears throat> and this is his experience of going on a cruise. And he hates it. <laughs> He, um, he finds it maybe endearing in some ways, but he just absolutely is, uh, it's an experience that's, he's not particularly excited about it when he gets this assignment from his editor and he has a lot of issues trying to be neutral in his reporting of, of the experience. And so his essay has a lot of personal and very humorous elements to it, observations. Um, but he's just very straightforward with his language. And so he threads also this kind of, um, this idea about sort of what, how he's supposed to be writing about this experience with what he actually feels about this experience. And then kind of trying to be, trying to be a little bit more empathetic about the people who really do enjoy cruises. It's a very fun read, very interesting from a craft perspective too. So that's a great one to look to as well. Okay, next, next slide, please. This is an incredible essay by Amaris Ketchum called Recorded Lightning. This was published in Creative Nonfiction Magazine. Uh, there's a great amount of content online. If you're not familiar with that magazine, there's a good amount um, online for free but it's certainly worth the subscription and they all also offer a lot of writing classes online. Um, but here you can see that she has actually designed a lightning bolt into her essay. So each part of this page, it can kind of stand alone on its own and some of it reads almost more like a poem. And then of course, it's meant to be read entirely from left to right all the way across as its own sort of standalone 
essay. So it's almost four essays in one. It's remarkable. Um, I see the question of what, what the name of the magazine is, Creative Nonfiction Magazine. Okay, next slide, please. And we are now at our second writing prompt. So for this one, we're also going to take 10 minutes and I'd like you to take an existing character that you have in your work, or if you don't have that, just come up with one and start writing an essay as though this character is writing. It can be any kind of essay, personal, um, braided, a completely experimental form. Just try, try something different. And then you might consider how might this particular essay uh, be woven into a short story or a book. And since fiction, we're, look, we're, we're dealing with fiction today, you can just let your imaginations run wild. All right, so 10 minutes.
Okay. We just have a little bit time left with our session today. So is there anyone who'd like to share? I know this was a bit of a, a tricky writing prompt, hard to really get into a, <laughs> writing an essay with just 10 minutes. Perhaps it's a, a good starting point. Okay, well, I don't see any volunteers. That's all right. Any questions at this point? Okay. All right, well then let's wrap everything up. Um, Jessica, next slide, please. All right, so in looking at this broader concept of this bigger ingredient of nonfiction, that there's this personal or intimate aspect to it, I wanna share with you this quote from Vivian Gornick, The Situation and the Story. Every work of literature has both a situation and a story. The situation is the context or circumstance, or circumstance, excuse me, sometimes the plot. The story is the emotional experience that preoccupies the writer, the insight, the wisdom, the thing one has come to say. So I find that Vivian Gornick's words here are so important in coming back to this idea of of what's, what's, what am I really trying to say, whether it's nonfiction or fiction? How can I create layers and, and depth and density and complexity to my work by thinking about what the situation is and what the story is? The memoirist, she continues, must engage with the world because engagement makes experience, experience makes wisdom, and finally, it's the wisdom, or rather the movement toward it, that counts. So again, in thinking about kind of what, what's the takeaway for your reader? Uh, what, what, can, what have you come to say? And what can the reader learn from your experience? And in the world of fiction, of course, the possibilities become just that much more flexible and broad. All right, next slide, please. So we have come to the end of today's session. Don't forget about letting in the sun. Don't spend too much of your time researching, although do have fun with research. Um, try some journalistic strategies if you feel like it. See where interviewing can take you. See where pretending to be an expert can take you. <laughs> Deep dive into a topic you have absolutely no knowledge of and see where that goes. And uh, you can always add a little salt to your watermelon too to provide some inspiration to uh, how you might incorporate sugar and salt or the ideas of sugar and salt into your creative writing work. Are there any questions that I can answer at this time? No. All right. Well, thank you all very much for joining me again today. And uh, if you would like a copy of the slides, please reach out, let me know. This was Thank really great. Thank you so much. I got so many new me. ideas buzzing in my head. Oh, Thank that's you. great. I'm so happy to hear that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, really enjoyed it. Thanks. Excellent. And I'm so sorry about this uh, bumpy start that we had. <laughs> Thank you all for your patience. <laughs> Have you ever thought of teaching a writing course more in, you know, in sections like week by week? So we cover one piece and go in depth and go, do you ever do anything like that? I haven't done anything like that yet, but I would love to teach on a more regular basis. So that's something I'm developing. Yeah. I'd love to have you do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. Thank you all so much. Um, hope we'll have more workshops in the future. Check our calendar. We're working on um, art, <clears throat> excuse me, art therapy workshops. That should be interesting to you creative people. Um, everyone stay safe, read books, write. Thank you. This is Have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you, Thank you all. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Monica. Bye.